So, good morning. I told Susan on her way up, this is most probably going to be the, the height of the fall foliage. Uh, this was a little bit different from many years because um, we didn't have that much color. Because up until this past week, we didn't have a, a frost. But um, as we drove from Sugar Creek, the back way, all the way up through Strasburg, which is a, a shortcut, the colors were quite nice. We've been looking at the so-called Lord's Prayer, or more accurately, the manner in which Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray. He said, In this manner shall you therefore pray. And as he was speaking to his disciples, um, he showed them, or rather gave them a framework on how to address the, their prayers to their father, his father, and their father in heaven. You know, as we saw, our father in heaven connects directly to the first two of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall make for yourself no graven images. And the reason we do that is because we have a real father in heaven. And this enables us, as Paul admonished us in Hebrews chapter 4.16, to go to the throne of grace boldly, to ask for help uh, in time of need. The second uh, portion of this framework of prayer is, Hallowed be your name. And as we saw in the previous study, this connects directly to the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. These two statements in that framework are followed by a third, which simply states that we are to pray, Thy kingdom come. This third statement, interestingly enough, connects directly with the fourth commandment of the ten, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath day pictures the millennium to come, the millennial rest, as we know from Hebrews chapter 4. It also points back to the creation. So I think it is safe to say that the request, Thy kingdom come, goes far beyond a simple request for Christ's return, although it includes that. Remembering the Sabbath day then is intrinsically linked connection to the kingdom of God coming to earth in every respect. It reaches back to creation. You know, the, the Sabbath is recorded in Exodus as being a memorial to the creation. <clears throat> it states, for in uh, six days God created the heavens and the earth, and then he... Uh, created by refraining from work the Sabbath day on the seventh day. It also reaches forward to the future time and beyond when that same king will come to establish his kingdom on earth for the purpose of expanding his kingdom and establishing it. Um, and of course, we will look at the two dimensions, if you will, of the kingdom. That of a literal kingdom on the earth and that of a, shall we say, kind that is referred to in the uh, first several chapters of Genesis, that God is creating man in his own image after, if we could say this, the God kind. So ultimately, the kingdom of God is his family. So imploring God with thy kingdom come includes all of this and more and provides a sense of identity with the past and a purpose for the future. I think one of the problems, well, I don't think, I know one of the problems with our current culture is that there's no sense of identity. There's no purpose in life. There is something, you know, if you take the Jewish people, for example, they have a unique, shall we say, sense of identity going all the way back to the tribe of Judah, um, the person of Judah, one of the twelve um, sons of Jacob. So if you're Jewish, you have a sense of identity. I mean, I uh, identify in a small way to that, 
having grown up as part of the Anabaptist um, church, Amish in this case, there are other denominations that would trace their roots back to the same origin. But that was a sense of identity and community dating back hundreds of years that meant something to us. In the Church of God, our identity and purpose is connected with the very thing that we're talking about. Thy kingdom come. Meaning, not just the return of Jesus Christ, but rather the destiny that uh, that ultimately points to in the future of us being part of the family of God. So it prevent, provides a sense of stability in an otherwise unstable world. Thy kingdom come, coming is simply another element demonstrating the faithfulness of God. I'll uh, refer back to something that I mentioned in the Kingdom of God seminar with regarding the Sabbath, that the Sabbath and the rest that remains, you know, it it reaches back to the future, meaning that it reaches all the way back and touches creation. It is a memorial of that and pictures forward to the kingdom to come in the millennium and beyond. So when Jesus Christ asked his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, it is not simply a request, please come tomorrow. Although, like I said, it could include that. It includes, it is far, it's much more far-reaching. The impact of the kingdom coming involves basically everything from the time of creation to the time of Jesus Christ's return and that time that we read about last week in Revelation chapter 21 when God ultimately dwells with men. What we're trying to do in these studies is to show that this is not simply a prayer that is that was intended or designed to just be a rapid repetition. Rather, it is an all-encompassing framework that guides us in how we should and can pray to God in a more effective way. So now that we've seen how this statement, Thy kingdom come, connects to the broader elements of God's plan and the literal kingdom of God, let's study the three words in the statement itself. So we're going to just kind of narrow down on the three words that are contained in here. Thy kingdom come. You know, if we look at it, let's look at the first word, die. I mean, it's one of those, uh, your kingdom come, if you uh, look at it in the New King James. But that first word does something that I think is very important with respect to the kingdom. It attributes ownership to God. It is not your kingdom and my kingdom. It is God's kingdom that is coming. And we see this revealed in the scripture at numerous places. We'll go and look at a number of them. It is a kingdom that is very different from all the others that man has either used or experienced or occupied because ownership is God's. It is his kingdom. And that is why it will change everything and should change our lives now. Let's go over to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 is perhaps the most definitive statement with respect to who owns the kingdom of God. We have here the passage of Scripture, Daniel interpreting the dream, but if we drop down to Verse 44, and in the days of these kings, you know, it's, it's um, interesting, and I'll just uh, focus in on this for a moment, you know, the developments in Europe, you know, the ten toes that are described here, that uh, Daniel 
prophesied would be ten kings. You know, we, we, we see things developing, and they have been developing over time. Um, and, you know, just the, the news developments the, this last week, the, the spying that the United States has been doing probably for a long time, but uh, perhaps more aggressively of late, whatever the case may be, um, if you eavesdrop on <laughs> Chancellor Merkel's Merkel, if I pronounce it in German, cell phone, you're not going to score any political points. I guarantee you that. She's a tough woman. I mean, she grew up in East Germany prior to the wall coming down and has had a remarkable uh, political career uh, is subsequent to Germany being reunited. And um, I think it showed. It, this, these are all developments that are percolating that come to the surface. It's cause and effect, but nonetheless, eventually will emerge in what, we de- what we're reading here as a ten-king kingdom that will rule right into the coming of the kingdom about which Christ instructed us to pray. Verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And a kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So, Here we see two things. Number one, it is the God of heaven that sets it up, that establishes it. Not a group of individuals, not a a body of people, uh, which we famously talk about, you know, we the people. No, this kingdom, your kingdom, thy kingdom, the ownership and the establishment here is clearly God's. The second thing we see is that in contrast to every single kingdom that has been established in the history of man, this one will stand forever. Because God owns it, because God established it, and because embodied in this kingdom is the promise of immortality and eternal life so it can continue on into the future. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, this is the, shall we say, the Christmas passage, talking about, you know, the birth of Jesus Christ. And, you know, these scriptures are in and will be read in the coming month um, as the celebration of Christmas occurs. But I think they miss a very important point. I mean, it's usually baby in the manger um, and in you know, all of the things that go along with it, not to mention, of course, the reason we don't keep it, um, and that is that we're we're actually celebrating um, a pagan god's birthday um, and have transformed transposed it on Christ. But notice here what was said in um, I begin in verse thirty. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. For what purpose? He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So here we have what Daniel prophesied about, prophesied once again by the angel when Jesus Christ was born, or even prior to his birth, that he would be a king, the king reigning over the kingdom established by God. So we see, and we'll read a little bit later, that it is the of our Lord and of his Christ. So ownership. It's interesting, when, God, when Jesus Christ asked his disciples to pray, 
He didn't ask them to pray to him, rather to the Father. And Jesus Christ, while he will be the King of Kings, always puts the emphasis and the direction back to the Father. So we see here the prophecy of ownership moving forward uh, with the prophecy of Jesus Christ's birth. Now we go over to Revelation chapter 11. Many of these scriptures are obviously very familiar, but perhaps we haven't thought about it in the context of the Lord's Prayer. In verse 15, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. This is a prophecy about the fulfillment of the prophecy in Daniel. Still yet future. And you notice here that all the kingdoms that were established become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So while Jesus Christ directs his disciples and by extension us to pray to the Father, ownership in this prophecy is clearly attributed to both the Father and Jesus Christ. It's their kingdom that they establish, that they own. That is why we are to pray your kingdom come. Jumping just across the page to Revelation chapter 12, we find <clears throat> when Satan is tossed out of heaven, the following statement, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. I mean, the very statement that is repeated throughout the New Testament, the kingdom of God, attributes in its statement ownership back to him. The kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God, Day and night has been cast down. Because ownership belongs to God, and because, as it says here, the power of Christ, of his Christ, have come, Satan can be cast out. There is bona fide authority in God's kingdom because he owns it. And with ownership comes a certain level of authority even on the earth. You know, we, the things we own are within our authority to do and to dispense with as we please. Now, if we're in debt, there are others that um, have a say on how you use those assets which you own but might still have an indebtedness to. God has full title to the kingdom of God, and for that we should be thankful. Let's take a look at the second word, kingdom. We'll look at this both in the literal and the familial sense. First, we'll look at the, the literal. Make no mistake, the kingdom of God is not some warm, fuzzy feeling that somehow just um, masquerades in your heart. It is a literal kingdom with a king and... Subjects, territories, I'll list them in, in a minute. That will change the world. 
I mean, there has been in times past, more so than today, the notion that the kingdom of God is simply something that resides in your heart. Now, as we will look at in the in the final statement, there is, there is, however, what we have taught in the church, and I think it's an apt analogy that the kingdom, the, the church of God is the kingdom of God in embryo. And I think that is a helpful analogy to explain that there is a responsibility to us today and that there is, that our heart in that sense must be aligned with the kingdom. Um, so that it is not simply something upon which we wait and have no positive change or action in the meantime. So those are kind of the two, that's why uh, I want to look at both the literal and uh, the familial um, part of the kingdom so that we understand its full um, scope, the full scope of what we are praying come. Mark chapter 1. When Mark, when Jesus came into Galilee preaching, here's what he said. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So there was an immediacy when Jesus Christ preached. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The message of the gospel should always include an action plan. Otherwise, it's just a diluted impotent message that doesn't inspire or compel or convict. And we're wasting both the time and the money of publishing the gospel as well as wasting the time of those who listen and read. The kingdom of God, the gospel that is, of the kingdom of God changes lives, moves people to change. And we notice here in this context that when Jesus said, you know, the kingdom of God is at hand, you know, repent. You know, he didn't then just sit there and do nothing. Notice the very next verse. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee and saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen, then Jesus said to them, come after me. And I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. So Jesus didn't just come to Galilee and preach the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying it's at hand and then sit down and do nothing. He immediately called disciples, unlikely disciples, fishermen, to be in this kingdom. See, Jesus did, he acted. He didn't just pray, thy kingdom come, passively. So what does it take to have a literal kingdom? It takes a territory. In the case of the kingdom of God, when we pray, thy kingdom come, what is that territory going to be? Well, Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. The territory, at least initially, will be the entire earth. And we read that, uh, or we, I should say, we read that in Revelation chapter 11, where, where it said, and the kingdoms of this world, plural, shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So we see that what we're talking about is a very literal kingdom, not just some idea or some feeling in your heart. Number two, in order for a literal kingdom to exist, you need 
a ruler or a king. And who would that be? I mean, we already read that it will be the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. But that's not all. This kingdom, while the ownership is God's, as we read, will be shared for the benefit of many. And we read in the scriptures that what Jesus Christ said in the scripture we just read when he called Simon and Andrew and said, I will make you fishers of men, he did just that. And promised them, you know, after the three and a half years of training, and when you think about it, you know, this was a, this was a, 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 a pretty aggressive, shall we say, apprenticeship program in which Jesus Christ taught his disciples the doctrines of the kingdom of God, but perhaps more importantly, showed them how to do it. He sent out 70 disciples. We'll read about that a little bit later. He sent out the 12, one by one in some cases. During their apprenticeship, they actually did what they were then expected to do in a greater scope upon his death and resurrection. The kingship will not just be Jesus Christ, because he is king of kings. It will also include the apostles. And as we read in Revelation chapter 20, the saints, those that are Christ that are raised at his coming. So this kingdom of God that we pray to come will be a literal kingdom with territory and rulers, plural. The third component that a kingdom must have in order to be a literal kingdom is citizens. And notice I say citizens, not subjects. And who would that be? Well, initially, it will be those people that are left after the massive destruction that will be inflicted upon the earth by the tribulation and the um, day of the Lord. But that is the, the, the beginning, the seed. You know, the kingdom of God is also um, compared by Jesus Christ as a grain of mustard seed that grows. If you put all the prophecies together, you will come to the conclusion that only about 10% of the world's population will be left when Jesus Christ returns. I mean, the magnitude of destruction um, is almost unfathomable. But those people will be citizens and that will then grow and grow and grow for a thousand years. And then expand once again at the second resurrection to include all those that have ever lived. So the kingdom of God will be literal and it will have many citizens for the purpose of becoming what the kingdom of God ultimately is, a family that is immortal that will live on into eternity. The fourth component that any kingdom must have, that any organization must have, are laws. Now, <laughs> you know, th that's one of those unpopular words, you know, the law, the long arm of the law and all, you know, it's always, so, so what you do is, <laughs> I, mean, I, f I find it um, almost humorous at times to see what people will do and organizations will do to try to work around the notion that, you know, we... We, we don't have the law. Well, the reality is that no organization can work <laughs> without some rules, standards, values, working instructions. I mean, you can make up um, all kinds of euphemisms for the word rule and law, but at the end of the day, 
if there isn't structure, if there isn't a set of standards upon which the people that are walking together agree to be held accountable to, it doesn't work very well. Susan is relieved today because we um, had our annual international quality standards audit this past week to which we get held accountable to down to minutia. And, um, you know, these, these auditors are trained to be able to go through and sample and find the one thing out of a hundred you did wrong and find it. But we embrace that as an organization because, you know what, every time we do it, we get better. Every time we do it, we get better, even though we're relieved afterwards. So the kingdom of God has the ultimate set of standards, ten of them. Ten, to put it in modern parlance, ten clauses that cover the entire spectrum of appropriate human behavior and successful living. So we see that when Jesus Christ came and said, the kingdom of God is come, it includes all of this. And when we pray, thy kingdom come, we are not just imploring God to send Jesus Christ back, rather we are imploring God to help us embrace all of what that means today. Now let's go to the familial uh, portion of it. Maybe maybe we should turn back to Genesis just for a moment to kind of set the the stage for what I'm going to read in Ephesians. But if we go back to Genesis chapter one in verse twenty-four, we read this. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and a beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So here we have a creative process, a, a builder and maker creating species. You know, we have a modern word for species. And the Bible calls it cattle after their kind. And then God embarked on a different and creative endeavor in verse 26. And he said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So, I mean, he used different words, but... He created a new species, another species, another kind of being. You know, we are, shall we say, mammals, but human beings are an entirely different species, even in evolutionary, in the evolutionary model, than all the others. But notice after which kind God made this being called man. He says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So from the very beginning of the book, we see that God's intent was to create a family, a kingdom. You see, there is the animal kingdom. I mean, we, I mean that is a term that is used... Um, and then there is, as revealed in the Bible, the God kingdom, the kingdom of God. Not an animal kingdom. And that is where it's all headed. That is what we are praying for when we say, Thy kingdom come. And then, of course, your will be done and on earth as it is in heaven you know, uh, follows through. Now let's go over to Ephesians chapter 3. (coughs) 
Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm, I'm going to read verses 14 through 19. There's a phrase here that I want to focus into in on, but this verses 14 through 19 is one sentence. So we want to look at the entire context. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So... Here, Paul is actually following the framework suggested by Jesus Christ. He's saying, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So, Paul is telling the Ephesians about this whole concept of the family of God. It says here that the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Why? That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Holy Spirit in the inner man. You see, when we embrace and ask for the kingdom of God to come, it includes these things that we read here that the inner man would be strengthened. It's not just a future event. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and depth and length and height. Not just a vain repetition. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Paul wanted the Ephesians, and by extension, all of us, to understand the length, the height, and the width of what it means to be named after our Father in heaven. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. End of sentence. That was a mouthful, but it clearly establishes the familial nature of the kingdom of God, which is the ultimate destiny and purpose. I mean, the the exercise, if you want to call it that, of rulership in the millennium is simply a process to fill a need with the output being individuals that have been taught, who have embraced, and who can then become a bona fide member, a brother or sister in the family of God with Jesus Christ. So the kingdom to come ultimately is that. But to get there, territory must be taken over, if you will. Rulership established. Rulership established and um, the people that dwell on the earth educated with the laws of God in order that they would be able to be transformed and adopted into the family of God. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verses 29 through 30. Verse 29, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me, 
that you may eat and drink at my table. What do families do? Or rather, what should they do? You know, that's something that um, our culture is losing. We Everybody's running hither and thither. And, and yet studies have repeatedly shown the importance of a family in order to be a family to at least once a day eat a meal together because food is ingested, sustenance is um, gotten, but more importantly, ideas are exchanged and relationships are built. Notice where this is done that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. It's described in a familial setting. And then finally, in Revelation chapter 21, the scripture that we read last week, we see the result in verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. The tabernacle of God will be with men. The family of God will go on forever. The third word, come. Thy kingdom come. Indicates action in the present and destiny in the future. I mean, we've we've talked about both a little bit, but, you know, it's, you know, Jesus Christ didn't ask us to pray about your kingdom in heaven. It just kind of stays there. Or some kind of kingdom in the future. He asked us to pray in a way that in which we both acknowledge his ownership. And the fact that it is something that is coming. Again, I go back to the analogy we have used in the church, that the king, that the church of God is the kingdom of God in embryo, like a child with in its mother. And I think it is a helpful analogy, particularly with the transformation that takes place at birth. And, you know, there's a considerable difference between a baby and a womb and a baby that's born that then grows. But um, it is a baby nonetheless, contrary to what is often said today with respect to the question of life. So let's take a look at some of the actions in the present. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 is a debate between Jesus Christ and the Pharisees. And, you know, they're talking, accusing him of casting out demons using the power of Beelzebub. And uh, verse 25 in chapter 12, But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. I mean, that's a, that is a, that is a truism that applies broadly to kingdoms, to communities, to organizations, to families, to churches. If you have division, if you have it divided against itself, it doesn't stand. It splits up. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. Then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. 
But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Notice the language. Notice the action in the present. Jesus Christ said, when these kinds of miracles and actions occur, the kingdom of God, quote, has come upon you. So when we pray thy kingdom come, there should be an expectation of action in the present, both on our behalf and God's behalf. My point, as I keep, maybe I'm starting to sound like a broken record, is simply that this is not just, these are not just empty words that we should recite. take a look at another scripture that is, here we were talking about casting out demons but let's take a look at Luke chapter 10 Luke chapter 10 here he's giving instruction to the 70 that were sent out now bear in mind that these 70 I mean they they were the 70, not just the 12, were sent out, and I use a modern technical term, as apprentices. They had not yet received the Holy Spirit. And yet Jesus Christ entrusted them with going out and doing these things. And notice that he instructed them in verse 9 to heal the sick who are there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. The power of God had visited upon them. Matthew chapter 5. There is an expectation of action in the present, or there should be an expectation of action in the present when we ask God's kingdom to come. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. The expectation of action in the present has a very high bar, a very high standard. If you look just one page over in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Therefore, you shall become perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. When God's kingdom when we as a church grow as an embryo of the kingdom of God, this is the standard by which we are measured. <clears throat> so now let's take a look at destiny, destiny in the future. We've already looked at you know, the literal aspect of the coming of Jesus Christ, and so forth. So, I want to just look at a couple of scriptures here quickly that look at it from a little different perspective. John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we have the discussion (coughs) between um, the Pharisee Nicodemus and Jesus Christ. You know, I... I used to read this passage, and it was always difficult to understand until I compared it with the gestation analogy. The kingdom, um, sorry, the church of God being the kingdom of God in embryo. Notice what Jesus said in verse 3, Most assuredly I say to you, 
unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This statement is in absolute parallel with what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul wrote and said, and I get there where I just quoted, um, this I say to you, verse 50, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit corruption. And then he goes on to describe the transformation to immortality, a very familiar passage. So while Jesus Christ said when he cast out demons and when the disciples healed the sick and when he had come into their presence that the kingdom of God had drawn nigh or that the kingdom of God had come, it is a different coming, if you will, than the future event that is described here. It is impossible for this mortal that I now carry and that you carry to inherit the kingdom of God. And in order for us to see it, we have to be born again to be transformed in the way that is described here. And then as the analogy or the description that is described by John in his conversation with Nicodemus, and then we will be like the wind to be able to appear and disappear and so forth. It's about destiny. Matthew chapter 25, I think it's appropriate just to um, quote that because here we have a pronouncement and then we will conclude in 1 John. Matthew chapter 25 In verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's part of what we pray for when we say, Thy kingdom come. It comes in a very literal and personal way and causes a transformation, shall we say, from dust to destiny or from dust to divinity. First John chapter 3 describes that. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Present tense. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And when those words ring true, thy kingdom come will have gone into fulfillment for us. So I hope that this study has increased our depth and length and height and width of our understanding to know that the framework that Jesus Christ gave his disciples to pray was not simply a repetition of words, but rather a framework that is firmly connected with the larger understanding and complete meaning of the kingdom of God.